Good morning. We'll open our service this morning by singing hymn 226. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the pilgrim way. For the hand of God in all my life I see. And the reason of his bliss, yes, the secret now is this, that the Comforter abides with me.
Mr. Fairley. The Lord, let's bow our heads in prayer. And we're going to come before the Lord and remembering those, of course, that are sick and needing God especially, and we do remember them. Uh, we continue to pray for Darren McElveen and Brother Wesley, and uh, we pray for Christina, Margaret Wright, and David Loudon, uh, Sammy Orr, and Edna Scott, and Beatrice McGarry. Pray for Patsy Doherty, and Alec Robinson, Dave Borland, and Sam Bloomfield, and Elizabeth McAreevey. Pray for Peter Moy, and Joanne Peden, uh, Philip Archibald, too, and we continue to pray for Philip. He's unwell, and uh, we pray for the family. Pray for young Andrew, too, that the Lord will uh, touch and heal him and make him absolutely whole. Hazel, and uh, we pray for Ray Laverty, Johnny McCurdy, Martin Moore, and Alison McClellan, Bobby Todd, and Ar Bobby Archibald, Joan Hunter, and uh, her daughter Joanne. Good to see Ellen Morris with us after such a long time uh, being ill. And we thank God for the touch of the, the Master's hand upon Ellen and uh, returning her to us. Robert Hunter and Liz Henry, uh, we pray for Roy and uh, Philip Doak. Uh, Gillian's mother too needs the Lord, and we do pray for Gillian too. Uh, she's got a very bad knee, and we do pray for her that God will touch her and heal her. Theo McAleese, uh, we continue to pray for this young man that God will just touch him and heal him. And uh, Ruby Thompson, it's good to see Ruby back with us again, and we pray that the Lord will be with her. We pray for Moira too, that the Lord will touch her. Gwenny Stewart and Robert Gilmore. We pray for Pearl Crawford and Martin McGarry, and uh, we pray for Tommy McCracken, Stuart Boyd. And remember Joan Logan too, that the Lord will touch Joan and heal her. Uh, Ivor Patterson uh, needs the Lord, and we continue to pray for Ruth McAleese, that the Lord will be with her and touch her and heal her. Pray for the Sunday school, that the Lord will bless our Sunday school uh, today, uh, the first Sunday, uh, back after the holidays. We do remember those that are bereaved, and we think of Ellen again. We pray for her. She buried her sister yesterday, and uh, we just pray indeed for the Cain family and for Ellen, that God will especially be with her as she has lost her sister. We pray for the ministry of God's word, that God will bless his word to our hearts and our lives in the name of Jesus. Many needs, God is able, well able. Let's pray. Our gracious God and eternal Father in heaven, in the lovely name of our Lord Jesus, we bow before thee again. Lord, we thank you for another Lord's day, and we thank God for the health and strength that you've given us to be here today, Lord. There's so many that would love to be with us, love to be here to worship and to uplift your wonderful name, but they can't because of their sickness. And we do pray for such people today, that God, that you will minister to them, that you will touch them with your lovely nail-pierced hand, raise them right up and make them absolutely whole in the lovely name of Jesus. For those in our meeting too, Lord, that Father God, that you would just minister healing in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for Calvary and for your suffering and for the great sacrifice you, you made, Lord, on Calvary's cross. And there you made salvation wonderfully and gloriously possible for us. Lord, we can say, my soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Father, we thank God this morning that our help is in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, now we just uh, would uh, pray for, as we gather around the lovely table of remembrance, we ask you, Lord, that you will bless the emblems to us. And as we partake of these uh, emblems this morning, that God, that we will rejoice and be glad that there was a Savior who died on the old rugged cross for our sins. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we do invite you to join with us around the lovely table of remembrance. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death till he comes.
like a babe when it cries for its mother, like a child I was helpless alone. Then I. the Lord. Delighted to see you all this morning again, and we give you a very warm welcome in the lovely name of our Lord Jesus. Some announcements to make. First of all, the new newsletter just hot off the press. Uh, if you get a copy of that as you leave the church building, uh, either in the foyer, please. If you'd like a CD of any of our services, you can have that, of course, by putting your name on the sheet at the back. The uh, 50p box is there, the pink box. If you'd like to contribute to that, thank you indeed. Looking forward to this evening at 6.30 is our evangelistic service. And the speaker to this evening is Brother Hugh Hill. We're looking forward to Hugh ministering God's word to us. And Barbara is going to uh, sing a soul of peace. So we're looking forward to the both of them uh, coming to minister uh, to us this evening. I think those are all the announcements now. We're going to turn to the word of God. <clears throat> Turn
turn with me, please, to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6. My topic this evening is, or this morning, is the reason for Pentecostal deacons. I want to uh, share uh, little uh, messages on uh, deacons. Acts chapter 6, and we'll commence reading at verse number 1. And in these days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the day of ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude and of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over the business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And God will bless to us again his precious, precious word. This is a very serious time again in the church, in our church, and the churches in general. In the near future, we uh, hope uh, to select new deacons to serve in the church. Sadly, uh, some have died and others are, are sick. So we need to do that uh, in the near future. In preparation uh, for that time, uh, we are going to spend a few uh, Sunday mornings uh, just uh, considering the office and the responsibility of deacons in the church. There is much confusion and uh, misinformation uh, about the role of deacons, having deacons in the church. I hope that we can clear uh, up some of the, the uh, things that, indeed, uh, that people have said about deacons. I'm interested in uh, traditions. I'm, I'm not interested in traditions or teachings of men. I believe that the final authority uh, for all matters of faith and practice in the church must be the word of God. Therefore, we are going to uh, concern ourselves with what men, we're not going to concern ourselves with what men say about the deacons and his role in the church. We're only going to concern ourselves with what the Bible says about these matters. Now, this passage does not use the word deacons in our English translation. It's still, it is often assumed that this is the first reference uh, to the office that would come uh, to be known as deacons of the Bible. This passage gives us some insight into why the early church uh, left the needs, uh, to, felt the need uh, to set aside a special group of men uh, to serve in the church. Let's find out why that we have deacons and see if they're actually needed today. The problem the church faces. Verse 1 exposes a, a conflict that was brewing in the early church. They had a real problem, and the Holy Spirit does not gloss over it. We must never forget this morning that where you have two or three people, you have potential to have problems. <clears throat> that has always been the way. When trouble comes in the church, it must be faced head on and dealt with and not, al not allowed to simmer or fester. That's bad. We must also remember that the church, uh, the, that the Holy Spirit has a remedy for our problems if we were willing to and able 
to hear the voice of God. There, there was a problem here in this church of multiplication. The Spirit uh, had added to the church in Acts 2 and 47, and uh, they had started to multiply. 3,000 souls, 3,000 men uh, and women had uh, been saved at Pentecost. Another 5,000 had been, men had been saved shortly afterwards. In this, their wives, their children, and other families. And you can guess that the church was growing leaps and bounds. It is estimated that the church in Jerusalem numbered between 20,000 and 50,000 at one time. That was some congregation. As a church grows larger, so is the needs for stronger leadership. There was a problem of murmuring, the Bible says, in the church. There was two classes of people here in the early church. There was the um, uh, Aramaic-speaking uh, Jews, and then there were, they were the natives of Israel, and then there were the Greek-speaking uh, Jews, Jews that had come back from various parts of the world. And the Bible tells us that they were murmuring. People are, uh, were talking about others uh, in, the, in a negative manner behind their backs. And that has always, of course, been a problem in church, hasn't it? Satan is always attacking the young church. And it always has and it did in, this, in two ways. It tried a persecution here in Acts 4. And he it, he had tried to introduce sin into the church. And both attacks failed, only caused the church to grow even faster. Now he tries a new tactic. If he, <clears throat> if he can, cannot uh, defeat the church from without, then he's going to try and attack it from within. If he can divide the people he will be able to cripple the church. That's what the devil's very good at, trying to cripple the, the church, trying to get some people that are unhappy instead of just moving out quietly and going somewhere else. They love to take people with them. They love to discredit dis, uh, or dissatisfy uh, people in the church as well. If we can divide people, he will be able to cripple the church. The same is still true today. If the devil cannot uh, uh, interflate uh, uh, us and attack us from uh, without, you can be rest assured that he will try to do it from within. He will do everything he can to divide us and cause us uh, to attack one another. And then there's division. There is no place for anger unforgiveness, division, and trouble in the church. That kind of thing is deadly to a congregation, very deadly. What the church needs uh, uh, to thrive is unity. We need unity continually in our church. If there is division, uh, people in the church uh, that refuse to walk in unity with the brethren, then here is what the Lord's counsel regarding them is. Romans 16 and verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. The Greek-speaking widows were not getting their share of the daily food that was supplied. The early church was committed to meeting the needs of its members. In those days, the, the people sold their goods and pulled uh, their resources uh, to see everybody's uh, need was totally met. Some of the more affluent people uh, within the church, like Barnabas, sold houses and land and give money uh, to meet the needs of others. 
Evidently, the apostles were responsible for seeing to it that the people were happy and supplied, and especially the widows had the food and essentials that they needed to live. And as the church grew here, <clears throat> the task became too large for the apostles. <clears throat> and some people were inevitably missed in the food allocation. And the Greek-speaking element of the church apparently uh, felt uh, that they were overlooked. Uh, they were they felt that the, the, the Jews here were deliberately passing them by. The problem was this. There was too much, too many things to do and too few hours to do it. As a result, uh, some things were left undone and it caused problems within the church. The church still faces problems of that in its ministry today. In our day, the sole burden of ministry in the church is most, in most cases has been placed on the shoulders of the pastor. And as a church grows, it is absolutely and totally impossible. If everything is left to one person, some people are, are going to be neglected and they're going to be offended. Problems will come and the church will suffer. And when this conflict arose, uh, the apostles here uh, took responsibility. They had uh, been trying uh, to be everywhere and do everything. They found that, that to be totally and utterly impossible, an impossible task. They reminded the people of the priorities, priorities of the ministry. We need to be reminded of these priorities in these days as well. And we need to look at them. The priorities of preaching the word of God. The apostles said, it does not make sense for us uh, to put off the necessities of preparing for the preaching ministry of the church and to wait on tables. In other words, they hadn't time to sit down and, and prepare sermons and, 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 and seek the Lord's face because they were so busy doing other things. The apostles recognized the, the truth that their primary responsibility was preparing for the ministry of the Word of God. This involved two elements, prayer and preaching. If these, pe if these men spent all their time handing out groceries and, and various things like that, they would have no time uh, to pray and prepare for preaching services. So the apostles were right up against it here. They were spending their time uh, doing a good thing when they should have been spending their time doing a better thing. Most people have no idea, of course, how long it takes to prepare for preaching. I would estimate that I would spend 10 or 12 hours preparing a sermon. So that takes a lot of time. Some people think uh, that you get a sermon right just like that there. Well, that's not so. Some people think uh, all you need to is the gift of the gab and just open your mouth and God will fill it. That's not the way it works either. Well, you can have that if you want. But if you want the word of God, then you have better guard your, preacher, your preacher's preparation time. Nothing we will ever do in this church will ever be more important than time giving on the pulpit to the word of God. The Bible, the preaching of God's word is vitally important. We can have all sorts of entertainment and we can try to bring people in that way. But if we do not preach the word of God, then we might as well not have church. And that's the sad thing. It's very difficult to, to bring people in because they're all looking for 
discotypes churches. Then the preacher must have time he needs to prepare properly. Sermons are important, but also people are important. Sermons must be prepared. Prayer must be prayed, but people must be ministered to as well. That's important. The church is made up of people, and where there are people, there are got to be needs. Where there are needs, there must be, it must be met, or the people will go elsewhere. The early church faced this great problem. They needed the word of God, and their people needed the ministry. Both were legitimate needs, and both were priorities. But it was impossible for the apostles to do it all by themselves. And we have, to, we have come uh, to the place where we understand that one man cannot possibly do everything. There are times when uh, we must shut ourselves away with the Lord and with the Bible and get a word from heaven for the people. So there is a problem. There were too many needs and not enough people to meet those needs. The apostles uh, place uh, the matter back in the hands of the church. They issued a command for the church to choose from their numbers seven men who will be the servants to the people, the eyes and the ears of the people. Let's dissect these verses and see what the office of a deacon is all about. They face a commission. The church was told uh, to choose from their own members seven men whom we may appoint over the business. They had the responsibility for choosing the men who would be their servants in church. The phrase over this business has been taken out of context and misunderstood for years. The deacons do not ex, uh, exit, or, or they, they, they do not, they're not the bosses of the church. No, no, no. They are not over the business of the church. In fact, the deacons have no more authority in the church than they are given by the church. The deacons serve uh, at the pleasure of the church. No more does the Bible say uh, that when a man is uh, chosen as a deacon, he is to serve in that position for life. It's not a total life position. Like a pastor, the deacon serves at the pleasure of the church. Any deacon can be removed from his office by the church at any time. Deacons are servants, not rulers. Now the businesses they, they were to be placed over uh, was the business of serving tables and taking the pressure of the apostles. The phrase serving tables uh, translates uh, the same word that gives us the word deacon. The word refers to a table waiter, a domestic servant, one who attends to the needs of others. People will go to deacons when they'll not go to the, pa the pastor. He is to be busy in his service and he meets the needs of the people of God. Any man who uh, sees the office of a deacon as a position of power uh, does not deserve that office. Any man who refuses to serve uh, and meet the needs of the church is not fit to be called a deacon. He is simply not worthy to hold that office. The commission was uh, for the church uh, to choose from, <coughs> from their numbers, men who would be servants in the church. 
You will have the, the responsibility to choose from your numbers four men who will be servants of the church. They face a, a challenge while the men they are told to choose would be a servant. They are also to be special men. We will talk about that requirement at later time. For now, we are, will consider the three qualifications mentioned here in these verses. The men were uh, to choose, the men that were to be chosen <coughs> were to be very special men. They were to be good men of honest report. This phrase refers to men who have uh, experience and who have experiences. It speaks of men who by their testimony and their lifestyle have earned the love and respect of the church. And in other words, they are already set apart. People notice the work that they're doing. People notice their, their ability. They're men of good report. It is referring to men who are saved and who are living a good Christian life. Those who those are to be men uh, that no one can point uh, an, ac an accusing finger at. Good men who are worthy of respect. They are to be men of personal integrity and unblemished characters. <clears throat> they must be men who avoid evil and seek the well-being of others. They were to be godly men. They were also to be men full of the Holy Spirit of God. This means that they were to be spirit-filled and spirit-controlled. The deacons are to be men who are in tune with God, led by God, and who, <coughs> who dispel godly ways in their living. The church will uh, forever regret electing men who are not full of the Holy Spirit of God. Men who is not filled with the Spirit but who are, is filled with his own ways and his own importance will be a thorn in the side of the church for as long as he serves. Be cautious about the men we select. They were to be gifted men. They were also to be full of wisdom. This means that they are to be able to make sensible decisions. They are to be influenced by personal, not influenced by personal opinion, family, or anything else. They are to make their decision based on thus saith the Lord. They must be men who can move beyond their own boundaries to see the needs of others. They must be men who can move beyond their own boundaries. Far too many deacons bring their own agenda to meetings or their family's agenda to the meetings. And when the deacons meet, they must always seek what is best for the whole church. Those are some pretty stiff requirements for a deacon. But these are the kind of men you must ask God to reveal to you when choosing. Men who are filled with the Holy Ghost. Men who will serve God to the uttermost and be there at all times. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for the word of God. Father, we thank you for the instruction that you've given us through your precious word. And Father, we thank you that you have set a high standard for each and every office in this church and in every church. 
Father, we thank you and we praise thee, Lord, that by the wonderful grace of God, we can attain those heights. God, our Father, we just pray indeed that you will give us wisdom and guidance and direction. And Father, if we're led by the Holy Spirit of God in everything that we do in this church, then, Father, we're going to prosper and people are going to come in and be gloriously saved. And Father, that's our aim today, is to see men and women saved by the wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and moving forward in God. Father, we pray for the evening service. We pray, Lord, that you'll come down in all your might and in all your power. And God, that you'll make this a tremendous evangelistic service. That precious souls will come to know the Lord as their Savior. Bless your servant, Lord. Father, anoint him with the power of God and the message that you have laid on his heart will be a blessing to each and every one of us. Take us to our homes in safety now, Lord, and bring us back in the evening for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to sing a closing hymn together. Deeper, deeper in the love of Jesus, daily let me go. Higher, higher in the, wisdom, in the school of wisdom, more of grace to know. Let's stand as we pray. Sing. <clears throat>